He was one of the biggest heroes of the 1980s. He faced legendary evils in ancient tombs using only his courage, his arcane knowledge, and a bullwhip. You know who he was. By 1981, Kenner was riding high in the saddle on toy aisles. Star Wars was a runaway success, and it was all the competition could do just to maintain second place. Well into its second successful year with the Empire Strikes Back line, Kenner saw another golden opportunity when George Lucas and Steven Spielberg teamed up to produce Raiders of the Lost Ark. Indiana Jones was born, and Kenner understandably licensed a new toy line from the creator of Star Wars. Harrison Ford, Han Solo himself, was the central character. Kids were going to eat this one up. Kenner also had extra incentive beyond the Star Wars connection. The Kenner designers had a pet project they wanted to see thrive in one form or another. In 1979, they developed a western-themed figure line for the quickly forgotten film Butch and Sundance, The Early Days. The figures were extremely well designed, with bendable knees and working gun holsters. But westerns weren't pulling in kids like they once did, and the film was a flop. So the early days died an early death. Its only notable contribution was making possibly the only Brian Dennehy action figure in existence. Not to be defeated, Kenner attempted to resuscitate the toys under the banner The Real West in 1980, but aside from a repurposed Creature Cantina playset made to look like a Wild West saloon, Kenner never brought any more of them to the market. Toymaker Gabriel seemed to have been inspired by Kenner's figure designs when they made the figures for The Legend of the Lone Ranger, also a western flop. These same designs were used to make the figures for Gabriel's Zorro line based on the Filmation cartoon. Kenner saw an opportunity with Raiders of the Lost Ark to finally steer their Butch and Sundance designs towards success. And so, like the Lazarus Man, Butch and Sundance rose from the dead once again and became the Adventures of Indiana Jones in 1982. The construction of the figures and some of the sculpting was adapted from Butch and Sundance, with the bendable knees and hips so the figures could sit in vehicles, and most importantly, ride the Arabian horse, which was a direct remake of the Butch and Sundance horses. Indiana Jones had a working holster for his pistol, and a hook on his waist for his whip, which makes him one of the coolest 80s action figures of all time. But he wasn't perfect. He was given that quick-draw spring in his right arm, which could be used for whip action or pulling his gun, but it limited his versatility. Additionally, Indy's thumbs were notoriously brittle and broke off more often than not. One of the oddest quirks about Indy is that his figure is based on one of the few reference photos that doesn't have him wearing his famous shoulder bag. When Indy first enters the Ravenwood bar, he's without his satchel. The Kenner figure is based on the initial visit with Marion. Kenner made sure to give us Marion Ravenwood, complete with frilly white dress and that little monkey, as well as a stand as her feet were so small she couldn't stay upright on her own. Marion also goes down in history as having one of the worst card back photos of all time. She remains the most prized figure of the series as she was hard to find back in 1982. Sala was also provided and came with a soft goods robe and a torch to assist Indy on his adventures. In the villains department, Kenner provided a few fascist goons for Indy to battle. At the top of the heap was Belloc, Indy's archaeologist nemesis, pictured in possibly the most boring outfit from Raiders of the Lost Ark. White pants, shirt sleeves, and a dandy red cravat. He wasn't graced with his Panama hat or jacket, or his pimp pith helmet and safari shorts from the opening of the film. He's just dull. 
But the biggest sin is his accessory. It's a postage stamp sized piece of paper. It's supposed to be an ancient map, but unless you roll it up, he can't even hold it. How quickly was this thing lost? Just find a picture of it online and print it out again if you don't already have it. Seriously, there's no difference. Next up was Tote, the German spy. Had it not been for Kenner, we'd have never known his name. He's covered in a big rubbery overcoat, so unless he ditches it, one arm is always useless. His other hand is permanently in the Nazi salute so he can show off his self-branded palm of the Staff of Raw headpiece. And he comes with a tiny German pistol. Kenner also made the beefy German mechanic, complete with a tiny wrench, which was carried by a completely different German. And the Cairo swordsman, from the most famous scene in the movie, where Indy just blows the guy away. This guy gets his sword, a dagger, a cloth robe, and black underwear. Indy disguised in German uniform rounded out the single-carded figures. Given the three-day beard that regular Indy should have had, as well as a massive grenade launcher, he seems like a frivolous addition to an otherwise small line of toys in desperate need of more characters. One of the elements of Kenner's Star Wars that made it so great was the inclusion of a large number of side characters, as well as cannon fodder cronies. For every bounty hunter with a name, there was also a faceless stormtrooper or officer to fill the ranks. Kenner should have been prioritizing other characters first, like Colonel Dietrich or Satipo or Captain Katanga, along with more generic baddies like the Nepalese thugs or the Egyptian assassins. It's stunning that a generic German soldier was never made, and this line desperately needs it. Way more than it needs Indian German disguise. This would be like if Kenner's original 12 Star Wars figures included Luke in Stormtrooper disguise instead of an actual Stormtrooper. Maybe there were political considerations. Who knows? In any case, there were three additional figures made for this line. The first is the Monkey Man, the eye-patched rat who sets up Indian Marion in Cairo. He comes packed with the Streets of Cairo mini playset, which includes a fruit stand, a hay cart, some baskets, some melons, a monkey, and a solid plastic packet of Marion kneeling so she can hide in a basket. Not exactly the most kinetic playset, and no, I don't count Marion here as an actual figure. There's also a map room indie that comes with the map room playset, which consists of a plastic miniature city, a staff of raw with a massive headpiece you can look through, a transit scope and tripod, a pickaxe, a revolver, a grappling hook, a journal, and yes, Indy's satchel. The map room Indy makes a good companion to the Sala figure, but for display purposes, the satchel always gets donated to the standard Indiana Jones. Finally, there was a mail-away promotion to get Belloc in his ceremonial robes right before the Ark blows him up. Not sure what Kenner was thinking with this one. Like map room Indy and German disguise Indy, this is just a variant of a figure we could already buy in a line that only had 11 characters total. Where Kenner's Indiana Jones line really shined was in the centerpiece vehicle and playset. A cargo truck was made for Indy so he could take off on the Arabian horse and chase down the stolen Ark of the Covenant. The truck was complete with a tow rope that allowed Indy to be dragged behind it, and with the flip of a switch get pulled forward as if he was crawling up the bullwhip to reach the truck. The doors were a little fragile, but overall, it was a cool toy. The showstopper has to be the Well of Souls. While considered a small playset when compared to other toy lines, the attention to detail is incredible. Kenner really hit a home run with this one. An intricately detailed base supported the shrine columns for the Ark, and the playset came complete with a rear breakaway wall that hides a mummy, the stone shroud for the Ark, carrying poles for the Ark, a grappling hook, a torch, tons of snakes, and the Ark itself in glorious vac metalized gold. It's a wonder the pickaxe accessory from the map room wasn't instead packed with the Well of Souls, because they used it to great effect finding the place. It's the combination of all of these toys that makes Kenner's Raiders of the Lost Ark so legendary today. That plus their relative scarcity. With this line, Kenner all but predicted the modern toy collecting by adults today. Accurate, movie-specific details and features, and very specific settings and characters. However, it was ahead of its time. The adventures of Indiana Jones wouldn't last long into 1983. 
in part due to the difficulty kids had finding the figures of Indy and Marion. The figures hit the clearance bins rapidly, and toys like the Streets of Cairo, Tote, and the Cairo Swordsman languished on toy store shelves for years alongside LJN's Dune line. But Indiana Jones wasn't down for the count. In 1984, with the release of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, the aforementioned LJN leapt into the fray with a new line of action figures. Their Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom line began with three 5-inch scale action figures of Indy, Molaram, and the Thuggy Taskmaster. And that's where it ended. Each figure was saddled with LJN's Battlematic action feature that would be exploited a year later on Thundercats toys. The Temple of Doom figures were solid, quite detailed, and somewhat poseable. Indy had his satchel, his whip, a removable hat, and the signature Temple of Doom thuggy machete, though he was not depicted in his ripped-up shirt, but rather the full jacket. And the hat's brim was a little too small, looking more like Kojak than Indiana Jones. Mola Ram came with his massive horned helmet, a dagger, and a staff. The thuggy taskmaster was packed with a bandolier, a pickaxe, and a sword. On the back of the cards, LJN promised us figures of Willy and Short Round, but those never materialized. Despite Temple of Doom being a box office powerhouse, and despite Ghostbusters not having any competing toys in 1984, the line fizzled quickly. The movie was controversial and parents were outraged by the gore and depictions of child slavery. Combine that with Transformers, Voltron, G.I. Joe, GoBots, He-Man, and a slew of other toys either launching or just finding their stride, and maybe the timing was just bad all the way around. Whatever the reason, between Kenner and LJN's failures, Indiana Jones had become toy store poison. Toy makers stayed away completely in the summer of 1989 when Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade debuted. Unless you consider a plastic cup from Arby's a toy, there was nothing to be had. For the next 19 years, Indiana Jones remained the underrepresented stepchild of Lucasfilm Limited. When Star Wars got three individual Super Nintendo games, Indiana Jones only got one. For every 10 Star Wars PC games, Indy was lucky to get a single title. And when Star Wars toys were reborn in 1995, Indiana Jones was nowhere to be seen, despite a very vocal fan base. In fact, the only option was to get a Disney theme park exclusive Indiana Jones action figure, but he looked like a drunk. However, in 2008, the worst Indiana Jones film ever made had one gleaming byproduct. Kingdom of the Crystal Skull gave Hasbro a reason to make Indiana Jones toys. The line launched with a mix of figures from Raiders of the Lost Ark and the dud fourth film. But Hasbro promised that figures from Temple of Doom and Last Crusade would follow. A few old sins were forgiven as Hasbro put out German soldiers and Egyptian assassins for Indy to fight. Marion was given a more action-oriented figure to boot. Much to the frustration of many, though, Indiana Jones was simply pumped out with variation upon subtle variation. All of the indies Hasbro made had strange, spread-legged stances, and his pants were so baggy he looked like a rail-riding hobo. Their attempt at a working holster was a laugh, so huge it impeded the lower half of the figure, and Indy himself was pretty hideous, despite Hasbro having made hundreds of versions of Han Solo by this point. You'd think they could nail sculpting Harrison Ford's likeness. The bigger problem was the critical failure of Crystal Skull. The film was so bad, kids and collectors alike had no interest in Shia LaBeouf figures or Ugga Warriors, and they filled the toy aisle pegs without mercy. Stores were hesitant to reorder new assortments, so Last Crusade figures trickled onto the shelves, while Temple of Doom figures, held back until the end of the line, were distributed to grocers and drugstores. Hasbro's turn at Indiana Jones emitted its last insulting gasp at San Diego Comic-Con in 2011, with a Lost Wave assortment exclusive that included updated versions of many of the original Kenner figures, as well as a redone Indiana Jones, because even Hasbro had to admit the sculpt of their first Raiders Indy was ghastly. But 20 years of growing nostalgia and a huge fan base couldn't bring about an Indiana Jones toy renaissance. Is Indiana Jones just a victim of bad luck? It's an exciting movie, they're fun to watch. Like you said, once you get into the replay value, I think it really goes downhill due to the, uh, the articulation of the figures, the design, 
it's hard to really get into that. You know, Star Wars is more vast universe. I think the toys are just more oriented towards the adults, and the kids are like, oh, that's cool, Indiana Jones, whatever, but the mom and dads were really the ones that wanted. Indiana Jones was probably more for an adult, in my opinion. Uh, it was a great movie as a kid. It was action-packed, and it was fun to watch. But I think adults had more fun with it. It was Indiana Jones. Personally, I think it's a combination of things. The toys are always very specific to scenes and locations from the films. There's a singular hero without a cast of thousands behind him to collect. Plus, Indiana Jones is the type of character that a child is more likely to pretend to be out in the backyard than play with an action figure indoors. Kenner's Raiders of the Lost Ark series stands as one of the greatest underrated toy lines of the 1980s. Its marketplace failings do not overshadow its successes. Beautifully sculpted figures with intricately detailed playsets and vehicles put this out far ahead of many more successful contemporaries. While the LJN line is a quirky footnote, and Hasbro's effort is a case study in marketing failure, Kenner's Adventures of Indiana Jones belongs in a museum.